It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. President Trump's appointment of John Bolton as his national security advisor last week is still making waves. Bolton is well known for his warmongering foreign policy positions clearly articulated on Fox News. Trump and Bolton agree on tearing up the Iran nuclear agreement and possibly even a military intervention in Iran. However, if we are to believe what the president is telling us through various means, his tweets and so forth, uh, he and Bolton seem to disagree on several issues such as isolating Russia, engaging in direct talks with North Korea about the nuclear weapons program, or the wisdom of having invaded Iraq 15 years ago. Why then did Trump appoint John Bolton as his national security advisor? Joining me now to analyze this question is Colonel Larry Wilkerson. Larry is former Chief of Staff to Secretary of State Colin Powell, now a distinguished professor at the College of William and Mary. Thanks for joining us, Larry. Thanks for having me, Sharmin. All right, Larry, now many foreign policy experts are trying to grapple with the issue of why Trump chose Bolton. Some say it's because Trump was watching Fox where Bolton is a regular and that Bolton was actually auditioning for a Trump administration position on Fox. Now others are saying that this appointment is so controversial that it was done to distract attention from the Stormy Daniels interview on CNN airing that night. Either way, we now have a very dangerous man in the position of national security advisor. Would you agree that he is dangerous? And why did Trump appoint him? I would agree that John Bolton is one of the most dangerous uh, Americans. Uh, and I use that term loosely with regard to John because of his affiliation so closely with Israel that I've ever met in all my years of 40, 50 years of service. I think you're right, and those whom you were listening to are right on the one hand that Trump did this at least in part to deflect attention away from some more serious crises that he personally is involved with, everything from Stormy Daniels to the Russia scandal, but also because he wanted to send a signal that he's seeking unanimity within his cabinet. And by unanimity, I mean, uh, people who will ask him uh, what he wants to do and then go do it for him without any dissent, without any questioning, without any uh, additional advice, if you will. As you pointed out, some of the things John Bolton wants to do might not be done, but that's a question too. Let's examine the position for a moment. I just spent uh, three hours with some very brilliant students doing just this. Um, the position of National Security Advisor, of course, is not contemplated at all in the 1947 National Security Act. It just sort of grew out of whole cloth uh, from Eisenhower on. Um, the position only has power if the president gives it power. The proximity to the president, the president's uh, relationship with the National Security Advisor, that's what gives it power. Ronald Reagan, for example, had six different ones. Trump is on a run towards that record, uh, having three already. But Reagan did it for a reason. He did not want a Henry Kissinger or a Zygmunt Brzezinski, who'd worked for Carter, of course, and had emulated Kissinger. He didn't want a national security advisor taking over his administration, so he had six of them. What happened in that event, though, was that uh, Bud McFarlane and John Poindexter went off and found their own power, picked it up, and ran with the Iran-Contra affair, which almost got Reagan impeached. So. We can see that doing this has its advantages for the president, but it also has its disadvantages. All this to say, John Bolton is not going to be any more powerful than Donald Trump chooses to make him. I suspect John Bolton will walk the length of the White House trying to find some power to pick up. Then that's very, very uh, dangerous in the sense that if he can't find it from the president, he'll go out and try to find it either through the bully pulpit, and Trump will cut him off at the knees if he does that. National security advisors don't normally speak to the press or to the people. Or he'll try to find it the way Bud McFarlane and John Poindexter did for Reagan. That is, he'll find something he can do out there with a nefarious Mike Pompeo at CIA and create his own realities, in which case he'll get the president in deeper trouble than he's already in. 
any way you cut it, it probably is not a very good decision. What does the fact that Pompeo, Bolton and Trump are on the same page when it comes to the Iran nuclear agreement mean to keeping the Iran agreement intact? I think it's very, very likely, and I would bet on it, that on May the 12th, Trump is going to, from his presidential position, uh, ex extricate the United States from the agreement. Then we've got several things that we need to look at very closely. One is how courageous are the Europeans in standing up to Trump and giving the uh, agreement some resilience, even with the, without the United States, and thus ultimately isolating the United States, not Iran, not the agreement, but the United States. Uh, and also how much courage Bob Corker at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and of course the rest of the Senate and the Congress have with regard to not doing things that follow up on Trump's uh, extrication of the U.S. That is to say, making sanctions back uh, for the U.S., snapping them back to the United States, uh, making more sanctions uh, on ostensibly other things like ballistic missiles, terrorism, and so forth, that more draconian, and doing things that make Iran, particularly the hardliners in Iran, figure they've got more influence and, and, and therefore that they bring Iran out of the agreement maybe increase the number of centrifuges again, begin to do things that look like uh, they might be uh, moving more towards a more robust uh, nuclear program aimed at eventually producing a nuclear weapon. These are all scary things, all things that have been put in check by the nuclear agreement. But if any of these things don't happen, if the Europeans don't have the courage, if uh, Congress doesn't have the courage to stand up to Trump and more or less remain uh, in a compliance with the agreement, then the Iranians will have no choice but to back out. And then it's anybody's guess what happens after that. Hmm. Now, um, Larry, the magazine Foreign Policy ran an article last Friday saying that Bolton plans to clean house and fire dozens of White House officials. Now, given what you just said about the ways in which he, meaning Bolton here, will express the lack of power he might have up against Trump and how he might uh, try to gain more power is by, of course, rearranging uh, the board in terms of uh, how he might wield more power. So what do you say to uh, how uh, Bolton might approach foreign policy and does this um, sort of smack of, say, uh, Henry Kissinger, because National Security Advisor um, under Nixon uh, took control over the entire foreign policy establishment at the time, superseding the influence of the Secretary of State, then Bill Rogers. Is this another situation we might be faced with? John will be faced with only the NSC staff that he can clear out of the White House, as it were. That is to say, he will have hiring and firing power over the NSC staff. That has become, even more markedly so with Trump, the center of security and foreign policy making because the State Department has virtually been disassembled. So John will have power in that regard. But again, I come back to the basic point. He can hire all the right-wing uh, warmongering people who agree with him, war with North Korea, war with Iran, war eventually with Russia and China. This is John Bolton. This is John Bolton. He can hire all the people who are in my mail with him over those objectives, but it won't make any difference if the president doesn't make decisions that align with John Bolton's wishes. So I come back to the other point that I made earlier, the very important point, the National Security Advisor is only as powerful as the president chooses to make him or her. All right, Larry, with that, I'll let you go for now, and we'll look forward to having you back. Thank you so much for joining us today. Just one parting comment. Um, John Bolton is the very last person on the face of this earth that Donald Trump should have made National Security Advisor. Larry, who would have been your pick, given the circumstances, of course? If I were king for a day, president for uh, four years, I think I'd pick as my national security advisor, someone with whom I could have a, a real substantive discussion about issues in the world and who brought maximum expertise to those issues, even though I might disagree with him. And that'd be Ambassador Richard Haas, whom I've worked with before, uh, who's now, of course, president of the Council on Foreign Relations. But 
Trump doesn't want someone like that on his team. He wants lockstep people on his team. All right. So what are the particular features of Haas that you appreciate the most? Well, he's, he's a brilliant man. Uh, he doesn't suffer fools well, but, you know, you can get around that. Kissinger didn't suffer fools well either. And he's a man who brings a broad, comprehensive understanding of many, if not all, of the global issues that confront us right now, security and foreign policy, and brings a sound head to those issues and sound recommendations based on those issues. I might not agree with him all the time. I don't. And Richard didn't agree with me all the time. But there are so many much more better people than John Bolton and Richard is would be at the top of a list of five or so that I would have. All right, Larry, as always, I thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.